Today, I am talking about biomechanics of ring fixations, which is actually the secrets of ring fixation, where you have to learn the basics of techniques of stabilizing a ring fixation. <clears throat> Just before going on to the topic, let me make it point clear that though we are all treating with the bone injuries, the real mother of the bone is soft tissue. Soft tissue need bone to stand straight so that its blood supplies are all open, veins are all open, so it supplies the bone. And bone needs soft tissue because it is supplied by the soft tissue. When a bone is broken, all the soft tissue will collapse and thereby reduce the blood supply to the bone. So in such situation, we must support it well by a stable frame or stable fixation so as to help the soft tissue to stand straight and continue supplying the bone. And that is the main aim of illegal fixation, to make it straight and stable so that we can control the bone fragments well. If it is not stable, can we control the fragments? So when you are not able to control it and the fixation is loose, it's called fixator loss. For example, this girl has a um, <coughs> Brown's disease. You can see her, she is having about 60 degrees of Various deformity here. I made the same frame with about 60 degrees and I am planning to correct it. At the end of it, when all the rings, everything becomes parallel, I expect the bone to come, come back to normal alignment. If it is not coming back to normal alignment, so that means there is a lot of fixator loss. My frame is not stable enough to get it corrected well. Maybe up to 5% of loss is acceptable. But if it is 60 degrees, I am getting only some 30, 30 degrees. So that means he is having 50% of fixator loss. So that shows my frame is very bad. So the main trick is how to make a stable frame so that your fixator loss is not there or is bare minimum. So low, a needle sort of frame it's only 25% as stiff as any other fixator in the axial direction and almost equally stiff in bending and torsional stress. In other words, it is 75% weak axially. So that weakness is well compensated by its elastic return to the start point. That means it comes down and goes back. Like in this picture, the tension wires of Elizoro frame acts like a spring lever. You can see it is in compression. When you load it, it comes to touch each other. When you unload it, it is distracted. Loading and unloading happens. This is called as micro instability in the axial direction, which is otherwise known as axial micro motion. The axial micro motion is actually part of the, the ring fixator. You don't have to make anything unstable to create micro motion. Do a proper ring fixation, the axial micro motion is hidden or it is embedded in the frame. <coughs> the overall clinical stability of a fixation depends upon two things. One is internal stability, the other one is an external stability. The internal stability is the stability of the bone fracture or the focus. By design, a transverse fracture is a stable uh, a fixate in stable situation. And a hypertrophic non-union and a corticotomy, they are stable because there is a good periosteum all around. Whereas an oblique fracture is not very stable because there is a lot of shear happening there. But this is a stabilizable situation by putting an appropriate oliver on both sides, which I will come to it a little later. So, in a situation where there is a poor internal stability, like in a mobile non-union hypertrophic, I mean, a, a pseudarthrotic non-union or an infected non-unions or a situation like this, where the contact area is very poor, you have to resect or debride that area, get a good docking like this 
reshape it so that you get a good intrinsic stability. For clinical example, you can see here, we say the ends are not touching each other, just a point contact, which is not a stable situation. So here I have changed the design. So interpose to each other, get, get a better surface area of contact. And the ensuing shortening has been corrected by a corticotomy from the top. The external stability means the stability of the frame, which again depends upon rings, wires, pins, and rods with a judicious combination of all three, three together. Coming to rings, the stability depends upon the size of selection of the size of the rings, the number of rings used, and where the rings are placed, and are you using full ring, half ring, or five eight? When you increase the diameter of the ring by two centimeters, you are actually reducing the axial stiffness by thirty-two percent, and reducing the bending stress by fifteen percent. A marginal increase in torsional stress is the only beneficial part, which is more of a the the useful axial and and my bending stress is reduction is more important. So, thereby reduces the stability. So, increase the diameter of the ring will actually reduce the stability. So, select the smallest ring possible for a clinical situation. Like in the leg, you measure the calf diameter, that is C, divided by 3, that is pi, plus 5 or 6 in centimeters makes the appropriate size of the ring. So, try to make a smaller ring but adequate size ring. And again, the number of rings also very important. The number of rings means if you can hold a long, long fragment underneath, two rings on either side with a block is the best stability. But many of the clinical situations, you have a very small fragment on one side where you are not able to put two rings. Then you must learn the skills to develop the stability of the the tiny fragment with one ring. So that skill is very, very important. Like the ring locations, when you make a ring block, so we keep one ring closer to the fracture site. At the same time, it must be off the trauma area. And the other one as far away or as stable as possible. And the distal fragment is very small. You have to stabilize it on, a, on one ring with appropriate modifications. In long segments, keeping two ring block on each segment is very easy. Whereas in a short fragment, you must learn the trick of stabilizing it on one ring and thereby increasing the levels of fixation by drop wires like this. Drop wire like that, one drop wire, drop wire. You can keep either obliquely like this or you can make horizontal wires. But when the fracture site is here, making a horizontal wire here is going to be difficult. So that is why I use the oblique wires. <clears throat> the stable frame is always a painless ring. So that patient can walk on that. The ring shapes is also important. When you use a full ring, since it is a full complete ring, you, as you tension it, it becomes more and more strong. Whereas when you use a half ring or 5 weight ring, that is not good for care wear and tensioning makes it weak. The stability based on wires, it again depends upon the number of wires. More number of wires makes it more stable. But appropriate positioning of the number wire, that is appropriate placement of the wire is very, very important. There are two types of wires, 1.5 mm, which is usually used for children, or 1.8 mm used for adults. And the wire divergence, that is how you place the wire, is important as far as the stability is concerned. And appropriate placement only wires, drop wires, and again, appropriate tensioning. So these are the uh, uh, parameters on the wires. Now coming to the wire, suppose you have a single wire. All illusory wires are smooth wires. So this wire you can see cannot stabilize the fragment well. So the, ring, the bone can move along the wire like this. But at the same time, it blocks the movement along this direction. So, this movement cannot be resisted by a single wire. So, to counter it, you keep a 90-90 wire like this. So, what happens is, now this bone cannot move in this direction because this prevents it. It cannot move in this direction because this wire prevents it. A 90-90 gives the best 
situation when you have when you are in a position to use only two wires, you must get 90-90. So that gives a reasonable stability. But in most of the clinical situations, we may, we may not get 90-90 hold. And you may get only 30, 45, 135 degree uh, hold at the bone side. So here again, this bone can move little bit to that side and this side. So a minimal, uh, uh, some sort of instability will be still there when you have only 45 degrees. So that can be countered by a conical pin used as a bisector for the obtuse angle. So this is the acute angle. This is the obtuse angle. So you can just put a bisector, uh, a, a bisector like a conical pin that blocks the, that makes it very stable. <clears throat> so if you don't want a shunt screw there, still you have an option. You can use only wire on both sides so that this bond cannot move this side and this bond cannot move to that side. So it is equally supported by the, all the instability in this direction can be blocked by only wires. We are very hard believer of using only wires. You can use that technique. It's very important in oblique fractures and deformity correction as well as prevention of deformity in simple tibial lengthening or any sort of lengthening. Whereas you can see now the oblique fracture. When you have an oblique fracture like this, as you walk or when you compress it, you can see a shear force happening like this. It just shear, it just slips from there. <laughs> to avoid the shear, you can just add one olive wire there and another olive wire on the opposite side and tension it to this side and tension this to that side. And now, when you load it, it just compresses it. So what happens is, the shear has been converted into compression. I'll show you an example of this young man who had a three-year-old non-union. You can see one shear non-union non there. You can see a shear non-union with multiple small sinuses and uh, a, a, a tiny sequestra there. So this was his original uh, Elizaro. You can see he is he's having five rings on the leg with two rings on the middle fragment, two rings there, and the distal fragment only one ring, two wires. The fracture is not even reduced. Here again, you can see only two wires which are not appropriately placed, and the upper end is completely free. So the whole situation is bad. More number of rings, but poor stability. I just revised it with less number of rings, only four rings, but with appropriate olive wires. So this olive wire will prevent the movement of this fragment to this side. And this only prevent the movement of this fragment to this side, lateral side. So as I compress it, these two will compress each other. No shear happens here. Here again, I put one olive anteriorly so that there is no shear happening there. Just compress these two together and it started healing in two months time. And in four months, the whole frame was removed. <coughs> so the next thing is wire tensioning. The more tension in the wire, they produce a more stiffness. How much tension you can put on a wire? The maximum is 50% of yield strength of each wire. A 1.5 mm, the maximum yield strength is 210. So you can do the maximum tension on only 105, 50% of the yield strength. And 1.8 mm can take up to 305 mm yield strength. The maximum tension is around 150. So we usually give 110 to 130 tension on 1.8 mm wire. So, Irizaro use optimum wire tension like you use only 80 to 90. You know, it's a manual tensioning device like this. You can't measure it well. And in limb lengthening, we usually use 90 to 110 because the process of limb lengthening itself will increase the load, increase the tensioning that actually loads on the wire. <coughs> in fractures and mobile non unions, we use 110 to 130. And for drop wires and half ring, generally we reserve to 70 to 90. And to tension the wires, it's always better to get a dynamometer, which is a must. Because this is the only way by which you can standardize the tension in all wires. Suppose you have one wire which is over, I mean, tensioned for about 130. <coughs> Whereas the other wires are which are less than 110 or even 100. Or, or you are not very sure of it. What happens when the patient is walking on the frame? 
the maximum load happens onto the maximum tensioned wire and the wire can go for breakage. And when you use the olive wire, always tension from the other side. You have an olive wire, you have tension only from this side. To tension from this side, what happens? The olive will move away from the bone. When you tension from here, the olive moves closer to the bone, make, thereby making it more stable. <clears throat> when you put wires on half ring, the issue is you put a, you have a half ring uh, wire there, you tension it. So this tensioning will collapse this ring. And after that, you put one more wire here. So And, and as the, you tension the second wire, you can see the first one again collapses. So the first tension is also coming down. So because of that, we don't go for too much of tensioning there. It maximum about 70 to 90 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, four drop wires and half rings. So this thing you can happen like warping of the wire. See this? It just, the arch, uh, the half ring shortens like the arch reduces. <coughs> and the post will warp the ring like this. So this again reduces the shape and the stability comes down. Your rods become deformed and abnormal stresses happen on the rings. Wires on half ring and five eight rings are bad. They are all bad choices. I generally try to avoid wires on half ring and five eight ring if at all I am using. And you can't tension it full because it's only half tensioning and produce a warping and rod bending. A rod will be bent like this. It produces abnormal stress on the other side. So generally, such things produces poor stability. Whereas when you have a step ring like this. The step is actually uh, a nearly full ring. So you can use a KVA here. You can see in the arch and the half ring, I have used only the pins. Because pins doesn't need tension. Rods again, it's again part of the stability. It gives a lot of stability for the frame as overall. And up to 130 mm ring, you need only just three, ring, three rods. And 140 to 180, you must have at least four rods equidistant. And about 200 mm, I personally like more, about five rods. So they must be equidistant rod. At the same time, see that they are supporting the nearby structures well, like your wires, pins, rods, hinges, and distractors. Because this has to be supported when you distract it, the force from this rod. Because you are going to distract on this rod. This force should be immediately transmitted onto the nearby instruments. So if for that, it is better to have it very near the wires, pins, rods, hinges or distractors. More rods means more stable. And when the distance between the rings increases beyond its diameter, that is if you have 160 ring, and the distance between the ring is more than 160, it becomes, it makes it unstable. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is just add extra rods or add sleeves around the rod. The rod is normally 6 mm. You add a sleeve, it makes 10 mm. Or you can even put a dummy ring without any connection to the bone. <laughs> Conical pins are and shan screws, they are very, very stable. And the main advantage is they don't need tensioning. And they are very useful for arches and half rings. Especially you can use even in femoral ring, femoral neck. And you must use appropriate size of the pins and threads. That is, when you have the threads, try to use full threaded one. And must have cortex contact on, on both sides. Don't use over uh, elongated threads. And conical pins are better because if there's any chance of loosening, you can just turn one turn so that it become more tight as it advances further inside. <clears throat> this is a pseudoarthrotic non-union, six-year-old infected non-union. He had a previous paid illusory earlier. I have just freshened the fracture site, docked it together, put a strong frame with all pins. And it has healed in three months' time. That is his function. And uh, even the range of movement has improved. Its knee range of movement has improved. With Elizaro and the second two Elizaros, and uh, more than six years, he has got reasonable good range of knee movements. I'll show you an example of a 
a compound fracture, a shear non-union. If I am using that non-union, I would like to use one ring just above the ankle and one ring below it, making a block in the distal fragment below the non-union site. And here, I will make one ring at the fibular head level and above the fracture site, making that as a block with one olive on posteromedial side with another olive on the distal fragment, anterolateral side, and a corticotomy option at that level. So this would have been my plan. But that particular surgeon, he managed to put a ring higher up, he didn't put an olive wire, and he did a corticotomy there, and started, started distraction. You can see the wires are not being tensioned, but it is all loosened out. He is trying to distract it there, only the rings are moving down, the bone is not coming down. So here it has slipped because the shear is happening there because of the compression. It cannot withstand it. If he has used appropriate olive here and here, probably it would have been much better controlled. But in spite of the instability, it is showing good callus. So they will think that this happened because of the corticotomy, <coughs> which increased the vascularity and uh, the infection burns in the fire of regenerate and all those arguments. Ultimately, what really happened is the osteotomy there has changed the biomechanical environment of the non-union. A shear non-union has been neutralized by another fra fracture there. So the shear force is being taken up there. We cannot, there is no pressure happening here. There is no shear. So what happened is the, it, it has completely unloaded and it's produced callus. So always remember, bone is a plant with its roots in the soft tissues. When its vascular connections are damaged, it often requires not the technique of a cabinet maker, but patient care and understanding of a gardener. This is a quote from Gerdestone, 1932. <clears throat> uh, and another part of learning any technique is always learn from failures. It may be from our failures or somebody else's failures. Complications are always plentiful with the leader. So mostly the technical failures, an unstable frame, poor docking, improper correction of the axis, wrong selection of corticotomy, and neurovascular injuries. You can see this fracture, the one which I have already shown, an original grade 1 compound fracture on external fixator, but not even well reduced. They put a POP after removal in about 6 weeks time. See, the fracture is still not reduced and was not healing even after POP. Now they did an illusory like this. The fracture is still not reduced. And now they thought they will just put in fragmentary screws. But you must remember that the fixator frame cannot tolerate interfragmentary fixation as it is 75% axially unstable. So whenever you put interfragmentary fixation, you must have a neutralization plate because that's a very, very strong fixation. So there must be no other abnormal stresses happening it to break it. So neutralizing is very important. A neutralizing illusory is not a very good concept. So the end result is a failure. So what to do now? He came to me and I changed his frame to new two block here, two block there and appropriate olive here and there and there is no interfragmentary screws or interfragmentary wires. I just compressed it. And he started working on that and that is the healing. Now the left leg is straight than the other side. This is again another pain with a segmental fracture was treated by an irrigator, one ring there, one ring here and one ring. So within the frame, the whole thing got deformed. But the alignment is good. The knee and ankle is good. It is just shortened and a compartment syndrome in the foot. And there is a mild translation medially. You can see the translation deformity. So it was creating like a virus. I made the frame, two wrong ring block on top, two ring below, and a middle ring only, one ring. Middle fragment only for one ring. And I tried to correct it. You can see now, the rings are appropriately placed. 
and slowly corrected it. And uh, at the end of the correction, I found the middle fragment was not following well. Mm -hmm. So I had to over correct the middle fragment because the fixation of the middle fragment was a little weak there because only one ring. So I had to play with that. At the end, you can see the whole thing is a little bit different. I mean, not very well aligned. But the X-ray is perfect. It is completely healed. So you can see that. So this is called fixator loss. Even after making it parallel, I didn't get the full correction. So the loss has been corrected by over correcting. <coughs> that is his final clinical picture. So the illusory frame looks very thorny from outside. But if you use judiciously with based on principles, and if you can give adequate stability, it heals nicely and the results are really beautiful. Thank you and all the best.